As we near the end of this decade and the 20th century, we find that psychics such as Nostradamus and Edgar Cayce predicted the occurrence of cataclysmic events before the year 2000. Jesus Christ also prophesied that wars and rumors of wars would increase. Nation would rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Famines, pestilence, and earthquakes would occur with ever-increasing frequency. The earth itself would become as a woman writhing in the agony of childbirth. Are we headed for what the Bible describes as Armageddon? Is the end of the world at hand? Or rather, is mankind on the brink of a new age of spiritual power and enlightenment, a new world order? Stay tuned as we cover these topics on Millennium 2000. My name is Norio Hayakawa. I'm convinced that a secret international cabal will stage a fake extraterrestrial type of an event or threat, artificial threat, creating worldwide panic in order to bring about a new world order upon the ashes of American sovereignty. July 10th, 1992, we're in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm with Michael Vaughn Matinsky, alias Mafia Mike. Michael, you used to listen to Radio Free America in Anchorage. You came on as a guest. We became friends. You were highly involved in politics. You had an interest in this particular subject. And uh, Well, tell me the story. How did it all start? Well, originally, I'm uh, from California, Southern California, as you know, Anthony. I had moved to Alaska. I'd spent about 14 years in Alaska. And I've always had an interest in uh, aerial phenomena, unidentified flying objects. Um, the night we were on your show together, I think uh, we'd spoken about that before the show, my interest in uh, UFOs. Uh, governmental conspiracies, governmental cover-ups, and uh, politics in general. Uh, that's pretty much uh, how we met. How long do you think it's going to be before they make the uh, announcement that we've had contact with uh, outer space and the Never. Culver? What? Never. You don't think so? No. I used to think so. I used to think they were getting us prepared, but uh, I have no doubt now that they never intended to and I fully agree with them. Now, five, six, seven years ago, you know, I was going on the lecture, hey, you gotta listen to this, you gotta see what's going on. Now, I know they were right. I mean, mankind is not, and will never be ready for this kind of information. Sure, it's interesting for you and me, and, and uh, you know, a very small segment of society, and uh, it, it's tremendously interesting, but no way should the public ever be told about this. What do you think would happen if they were? It would probably cause uh, problems that the governments of the world are not equipped to handle. The basic issue is religion. John, how many uh, world records did you, did you hold? 17? 17. 17. 17. Right. 17. They've all been broken. Most of them have been broken because the, of, the, uh, of the new airplanes that have come out. Yeah. I'm hearing rumors at Area 51 that there are well, there's at least one live alien living there. There definitely is one live alien, uh, regardless of what Bob says today. Yeah. We're talking about Bob Lazar. Um, during December and January, uh, December of 1988, January of 1989, when he was working up there, he sat right in that chair uh, whenever he'd come back from the test site, and he'd tell me what he saw. And I'll never forget the January of 1989, I was sitting at that desk writing out checks, and he comes in and, and he said, John, you'll never know what it's like to see your first alien. Today on Millennium 2000, we talk of the Panic Project. Is there such a plan to control the people of the world by putting them into a panic so that they would surrender their sovereignty to a new world order with the threat of some sort of alien existence is the media controlled yes is the publications that you read controlled yes 
For the most part, that's true. But today we're going to have a different look at this problem with Norio Hayakawa, the Southwest Regional Director of the Civilian Intelligence Network. Norio, is there such a plan to panic the population of, of, the, of the Earth and have them surrender their sovereignty to a new world order? Yes, there is a worldwide staging of an event to create an external threat, thus plunging the world into acceptance of the new world order. Well, we talk about uh, Area 51, and you're the expert on that subject. Uh, there's even a book out now called uh, Area 51, A Viewer's Guide by Glenn Campbell. And this came about as a direct result of your prior investigation, which uh, brought to the attention of the people of the world this particular base. In fact, uh, we take a look at popular science, uh, secret air base. The government doesn't want you to know. This is where they tested the U-2, the SR-71, the Blackbird, the Aurora, the F-117. Uh, uh, this has been going on for a period of time, and they are currently testing anti-gravitational flying disks, uh, what most people would call uh, UFOs, unidentified flying objects. But aren't these terrestrial? Well, for the most part, I think that uh, from what we have uncovered, these are terrestrial crafts and are being produced and are being tested to present a simulation of being extraterrestrial vehicles. So in other words, the people who manipulate the media are interested in getting us suckered in or conned into thinking that there will be some sort of invasion from space. I mean, H.G. Wells did this with uh, War of the Worlds in 1939. Some people actually went out and committed suicide. And if we were to find uh, on the news some night uh, a, a picture of an alien uh, or there was uh, some sort of real flying saucer footage, I mean, uh, approved by the government, and they said, well, we have had contact from outer space, we must dissolve this thing called nationhood, and we must accept a global government upon the ashes of all national sovereignty. They would go, for, uh, the people would go for it. No believe. question about it. There will come a day, and I think the day is approaching, uh, where, where on uh, they will make such an announcement, and uh, it will be a great mistake to believe such an announcement, should that announcement come, because uh, this whole thing is a brilliant uh, deception, what I call a grand deception. Well, uh, we talk about the Illuminati. I produced some records years ago on the Illuminati, the Council on Foreign Relations at 58 East 68th Street, New York City. This group has been directing our thoughts, uh, they, they've been directing our politics for years, and they have been directing the events up at Area 51 in Nevada. This is uh, about 120 miles north of Las Vegas, and we went together up there into the Tickaboo Valley and took a look at uh, um, flying saucers or uh, a craft that would go Mach 10 or 12 uh, and it would say would simply shoot across the sky and stop and uh, then shoot straight up. Uh, just These are not conventional aircraft. These are not conventional aircraft, uh, Anthony. Uh, these are the result of uh, many, many years of research and development uh, by the uh, military, uh, by the use of the uh, uh, aerospace industry. Now, the, the aerospace and industry we're talking about, we're talking about Northrop, and they've got a facility out here in Tehachapi. Yes, in California, there are secret bases where they are testing the parts to assemble these types of new crafts uh, that resemble a typical flying saucer. Uh, Northrop, McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, all these uh, companies now, McDonnell are Douglas has a base over here at, at Yano. In and Yano. They've got about a three or four story building that yes. moves, moves on, on wheels, on yes. tracks. To cover the objects that are being placed on uh, the top of these uh, 70 to 80 feet tall pylons. It looks like a Lexus hood ornament. That's right. 
and uh, we're also talking about the secret Lockheed facilities in uh, outside of Helendale, California, where they have a huge opening to an underground facility. And uh, they are some strange metallic objects being placed on top of these pylons. Now they have these triangles, or uh, they should, I guess uh, like diamond-shaped patterns yes. on the middle of what appears to be a runway. Yes. And these diamond-shaped, uh, I guess, uh, designs open up into, uh, into silos, and from these silos come the craft that are... Uh, yes. that are being tested and these, are flown out of there. Yes, these are almond-shaped crafts. So some of them are triangular. Most of them are almond-shaped or diamond-shaped crafts. Uh, like the, the Black Manta? That's right. Uh, but uh, Black Manta is a more, more, more a triangular. Now, we're talking about metallic crafts that slowly appear from underground being placed on a 70-foot tall metallic pylon, what we call a pylon, and they appear from underground, and then when they get to the fullest level, which is about 70 feet above the ground, still being placed on top of the pylon, then they test the radar absorption of that object. Uh, these facilities are not built above ground, they are built below ground, like the, the uh, place in, in Tehachapi, I believe it's called the, uh, the Ant Hill. The ant hill, now 29 levels down, is that it? Yes, that, this ant hill, this Northrop facility in California, not Nevada. We're talking about two different things. We're talking about uh, separate uh, facilities, but they are doing the same thing. The, the facilities in California are producing things, and they are sending, shipping to uh, Nevada, to Area 51, where they actually yeah. fly these things. Groom Lake facility is basically uh, the black, uh, deep black project programs, but we believe that south of Groom Lake, about 10 miles south, is another dry lake called Papoose Lake. Uh, and this is where we believe that higher technology, higher than the black project program, is being conducted. Well, we're such talking as about the above top secret. And that's you, right. you can take a look at the map here that's and, right. uh, and, and see this. Uh, are we going to be having hell on earth if these people succeed? Well, we are heading towards that direction, no question about it. Uh, and where it's going to start is, without question in my mind, Area 51, the Groom Lake S4 complexes located in the remote part of Nevada. And this is where the nation's leading edge technology is all concentrated. Aerodynamics, uh, the amazing revolutionary type of pro, uh, pro, uh, the uh, aerodynamic uh, propulsion systems, the medical technology. McDonnell Douglas also announced uh, just about 10 years ago that they have come up with a new type of suit, uh, the helmets for select pilots, uh, suit and the, pi uh, the uh, helmets uh, in which uh, the pilot can withstand multi-G forces. Uh, these suits are uh, filled with uh, liquid. Uh, in other words, when space uh, astronauts uh, in the shuttle, mm -hmm. they, they, they go up there, they have to withstand at least, uh, um, I mean, three, four, five Gs. And uh, without these suits, everybody will be crushed to death with the uh, force of uh, gra uh, the gravity. The technology is uh, ex explained in this um, piece by Bob Lazar, excerpts from the government Bible. Uh, Lazar was supposed to have worked over in Area 51 and actually uh, did uh, reverse engineering on a craft that he said was alien. In fact, he said there's uh, seven or eight or nine different craft over there. How do you explain that? Well, again, considering the fact that there is a manipulation process going on, uh, it's probable that uh, uh, Mr. Lazar and other uh, select scientists were called in to this part of Nevada to go through this um, uh, program of uh, anti-gravitational research or anti-matter research, but the the, we have no absolute evidence that uh, the alien entities are involved at all. In fact, uh, maybe the whole thing could be a brilliant uh, manipulation. In other words, 
possibly these scientists could be shown some things that look like alien uh, craft, but uh, which may not be at all. From Las Vegas, Nevada, USA, hello everyone, this is Lou Epton. And in the first hour of today's program, two outstanding investigative reporters who between them have almost 40 years digging into the behind the scenes activities of the government. And they both just this morning come back from Rachel, Nevada. Rachel, Nevada, how many of you are familiar with Rachel, Nevada? You may know it better as the home of Area 51. That's the title I think most everyone can relate to. That's the place the world has come to know. It's also the place the military research base that the bureaucrats say doesn't exist. Now, it wasn't their first visit to Area 51, and it probably won't be their last. But right now, let's all say good morning and good to have you in the studio. Anthony Hilder and Nariel Hayakawa. Gentlemen, thank you well, for joining us. Thank you, Lou. Well, we're at the uh, base of this hill called Whiteside, uh, one of the two hills located within the uh, public land uh, section. Uh, we're, we're still on legal ground uh, limits, and uh, we'll be climbing this Whitesides and uh, you can actually see the Groom Lake facility from White Sides. And we're still on public land. Uh, the, the government uh, missed these two spots, White Sides and the Freedom Bridge, when they uh, withdrew all these lands in 1985, actually. 1985, they drew a boundary, but they forgot that uh, you can see Groom Lake from uh, climbing atop of this, uh, th these two hills. So this is white sides because the white of the uh, the side of the mountain is uh, rather white, so it, they named it White Sides. They stopped on the road. Well, they're watching us. They got binoculars. Go up and take a picture. Then come, in fact, come down, Norio, yeah. and talk to them. In fact, I'll hide there, well, and, then, well, and I'll try to take their picture. Yeah. <laughs> Norio? Yeah. yeah, if you do that, then when they come up to the car, then come jump out of the car with the camera. Out. That's all legal. Okay, we got to kind of watch your voices now. They're, they can hear for at least a half mile clearly yeah. at a very comfortable voice, so they've got great listening stuff. Okay. We're, uh, Walking up Freedom Ridge, uh, Anthony, who's right over here, and uh, Damaro and Chuck and Kathleen, the psychic photographer, and uh, we're going to see, have a look at Green Lake from Group Green Lake, Groom Lake from here, and uh, see what it looks like. Norio came along too, but he stayed down at the cars because we saw a security vehicle uh, trailing us. They saw us and were observing us. So but we waved back. We waved back, yes. But Chuck says they'll uh, probably come up to the cars and uh, run the license plate, so uh, Norio will stay down there and get a shot of that. To get a shot of that, he's gonna hide and maybe surprise him. So hopefully they won't arrest him and haul him off with the keys to the van and we'll have to walk out of here. Oh, that was the easy part. That's the easy part. Yeah. Basically, we're just gonna follow this ridge line up now and uh, you'll hit a decision point when we get to that one little shelf. You gotta climb like one rock, which is about six foot high. Uh, if, you make, if, if you go past that point, you're committed to go a little further where you can cut across and come down this other ridge if, if you decide to not go all the way. But we're gonna go up that ridge there to the highest peak that you see. We're gonna uh -huh. walk right up the ridge. It takes about 40, 45 minutes to walk up there comfortable, taking breathers as you need them. Well, if I'm right here, yeah, 40, 45. Wow. And, you know, you know, it, it, it just depends, you know, how many breathers you have to take. It's just a comfortable walk. Takes them 40 minutes, takes me an hour and 20. Well, I've done it in 25. <laughs> One Come time aboard. they put the chopper up over the hill while I was just starting up, and I knew that they were trying to keep me from going up there and seeing something. They were trying to get stashed, so I, I ran up the hill. <laughs> what did you see? What did you see? I you saw them run. getting some stuff put away in hangers that they, they'd had out. Mm -hmm. They were trying to distract me with the chopper, and it worked the opposite way. I, I, I figured out what they were doing, and 
so you're and charged the hill instead. <laughs> but they saw you taking pictures of the chopper, right? The people, the guys oh, in the yeah, chopper. Oh yeah, was it the yeah, one? Yeah, one that you one had? time they called the sheriff. Other times they've watched me openly photograph them right in front of their face, a few feet, and done nothing mm -hmm. about it other than get out of my vicinity because uh -huh. we're violating several federal laws in right. doing that. I've seen those pictures with the helicopter real close up and there was a guy looking yeah, right I'm out at you blade. when you were taking I mean, you know, the picture. Right, there. right, he was like looking yeah. out like that. The choice that. was do I pull my camera and let him know I've got a camera and photograph him right there or do I throw a rock at him and bounce it off the helicopter? <laughs> I did you. Well, I was going to dent his helicopter for him, but <laughs> if the thing would have inadvertently bounced upwards, it would have crashed the helicopter and killed all of us. Ooh. And then you would have really been in trouble. Well, I, well, been, I, I would have been dead. <laughs> How far, how high is this peak? Uh, the peak up there is 6,089 feet. So, and about how far? 6,089 feet? The peak up there at the very top is 6,089. Right here, we're at about, uh, well, probably 5,400. Well, let's go. that stretches out across the valley here is that's the Groom Boulevard that heads into the base from Highway 375. And uh, twice a day, uh, there's a white bus that has blacked out windows that picks up workers. Uh, in the morning, it picks them up about seven o'clock over uh, at the junction of Highway uh, 375 and 93. And it brings them in here, takes them into Area 51 where they work. And then at four o'clock, it reverses its track and brings them back out and drops them back off out there. Uh, it's at the ruins of an old uh, gambling casino there at the intersection. Uh, so you, you, Sometimes you drive by there, you see cars parked there. It's a park and ride, but uh, there's only a handful of guys that leave their cars there. Usually the wives drop them off. But uh, it's a regular daily bus trip that comes out here five days a week. How many times have you been up here now? Uh, oh, probably 90 or 100. There was a while, about a year ago, I was coming up, uh, oh, two, three times a week, spending a couple days at a time quite often. I think the most I was ever up in one week was, uh, I was up, uh, I think five times in seven days. So, uh, you'd camp up here? Uh, sometimes you do. You know, you backpack up a sleeping bag and, uh, some, uh, cold food and stuff and water and whatever video equipment you need and, and camp out. Well, they must have known you were here then. No, actually they didn't the one time. Uh, that was the time I got to see Aurora in a lighted hangar. Uh, it was about 20 below zero, 30 below zero, cold, windy. In uh, early February last year, I'd been here for two days using no heat sources, no light sources. I had a mask on my face, so I was not displaying an infrared image to him. And uh, one night, about 2.30 in the morning, uh, the Bromley lights came on, which signals that something's going to happen. And all of a sudden, uh, one of the hangars opened, and it was so brightly lighted. And there was Aurora for about 20 seconds in full, brightly lighted hangar, sitting still. And then the hangar light went out, and they taxied out and immediately took off. The whole time, from the, from the time he rolled out of that hangar to the time he was airborne and gone was less than a minute. Aurora doesn't exist, right? Aurora is operational. It, it's probably going to be announced within the next few months to the public. They may not call it that, but whatever they call it, it'll be the Aurora. I heard they call it Senior Citizen also. Well, I've heard a lot of names. Looking over the uh, test range now, we see where they shot a flare. See if I can get a steady start of the, a steady. Oh, we're just about to the top. Yeah. So, uh, why don't you come on over here? Yeah. This is interesting. We've just spotted a second vehicle joining the first security vehicle down there looking at us. It's, it's, it's with the other one? 
so, uh... He stopped, no? He, came, he went off the road. He turned. Well, if one won't go up and check our vehicles and run into Norio. Who will uh, probably recognize that? Oh, I chased you out of here once before. Well, 15 feet to the top now. Yeah. 15, I only got to go 15 more feet. I don't think you can make it. I made it. Ah, oh, not yet. <laughs> There it is. Room Lake. Is it all iced over or what? Uh, it's, it's mostly uh, water. A little bit of ice around the edges probably right now. It's only a few inches deep. In the summer it's dry. In most, most winters it's dry. Uh, there are... Uh, let's see, there's one... 737 sitting there. Oh, they must have some of their hazardous burning going on. There's smoke coming out off of the helicopter out in front of the North Hangar complex. Yeah. What's that kind of flickering next to the big hangar out there? Next to which side? To the, to the right side. Right side. Yeah. Uh, there's a 737 there, and there's looks like a golf screen there, too. <laughs> Well, the naked eye is something like flickering or reflected off of it. God, you can see that from here? See, on the left, you've got the big hammer. You've got the control tower and almost the first hole, and then you've got a plane to the right of that and behind. And this is no point in pretending we're not taking photos. I am on white sides overlooking Groom Lake. I am taking photos and they know it. So, the only thing left to see is if we make it back with the film. I can even hear their, hear their car idling down there. Your comments and commentary. <laughs> Well, it was a torturous ascent for someone as out of shape as myself. But uh, after much struggle, I made it. And I am on top of Whitesides with other fellow adventurers. And we are looking over a... Over there. Overlooking Groom Lake. Watching the, the uh, security people watch us. Another one is coming too. Another what? Coming. From the oh yeah, coming down the road from the guardhouse. Nice, pretty all like burst upon us. Uh, with machine guns blazing. It's uh, it's late in the afternoon. You can't see the base all that well because the sun is shining off of the uh, frost on the lake. But we're here. Those guys really must feel like ridiculous ass. Well, I've enjoyed it. I hope you have too. I'm enjoying the trip down considerably more than I did the trip up. We just came down from off the hill, and uh, Norio is not here. He was supposed to be here with the car. He's got the keys to the car. This is no joke. This is no joke. Now, when we were up there, I did hear some people, ta somebody talking. It might have been Norio talking with the security. And they may have taken him away, but... Well, we have to find that out. Why would they take him away when they know we're up there? You know, I was just joking. I said, what if he was abducted and never seen again? I mean, and here we are, and... That thought came to my mind. I thought maybe he wouldn't be here when he gets here.
Oh, he couldn't have, well, couldn't have been abducted. I mean, I don't mean by aliens. No, not by aliens. I mean by whacking hut SS or uh, security forces. I mean... The sunset. Norio! Well, we'll just have to go up to the security base and find out what happened to him. Oh, that's right. We'll go up to the gate and we'll get arrested. Well, he'll be seen again. It's just that he's not I here. Feel, I feel they have to have taken him for some reason. Questioning. And the vehicle is coming now. Maybe he might be coming back. Is there a vehicle coming? Is there a vehicle yeah, coming? Yeah, something coming right now. So, yeah, I hope we thought you'd been abducted. I hope you were uh, faster. We, we thought we thought that you had been abducted. No, we just we were we were only here about five ten minutes, but we thought we thought the camo dudes must have taken you off or something. There's this couple is from uh, Redondo Beach. How you doing? I, I was just I was just uh, you know walking on that uh, Groom Road and, uh, and we thought yeah, it's Mario. <laughs> you went out to Groom Road. Huh? You, you went out to Groom Road? Yeah. Why? We have, no, I just... Uh, we, have an, um, we just came from up there and um, took some pictures. And... Now, we were really concerned. Oh. But he had arrived. Just for a couple of minutes. <laughs> just for a couple of minutes. <laughs> You're pretty sure of that, are you? Well, I had a dream so, uh, about it. You had a dream about it? So that's why you came out to be abducted? <laughs> no, I don't want to be abducted. Is, is abducted being, you know, mutilated? No, no, not mutilated. Just up for, for sexual experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Could you relate the... Uh, the you know, the times you went up there with the Lazar looking for, uh, for craft yourself. We went up, uh, twice. So the first time was not, the first time he knew it was going to fly. He knew it was going to fly just after sunset, and that was March 22nd, 1989. And we drove up there with Gene Huff, and we had my motor home. And, uh, we pulled in just as it was getting dark, and I was setting up the Celestron scope. And um, they were outside looking. They said, here it comes. And you can see this real bright light coming up from behind the, um, the range. So I got the Celestron scope hooked up and got it focused in. And I had, you know, like uh, maybe about 15, 20 seconds. Um, I don't have the scope here, but it's eight inches. And it's, it's a huge scope. And it, the disc, you know, pretty much filled um, the field of view. And it was tilted like about 30 degrees. It was kind of yellow-orange, and it was kind of diffusing. And I just saw it just as it started to go back down. And, out. and uh, we waited a couple um, a couple hours that night and didn't see it again. The next Wednesday night was uh, March 29th, and I was on a flight with American Trans Air stuck in Minneapolis. Uh, and that's the night I phoned Bob um, and said, what's going on? He said, we're going fishing. and. I thought, oh, neat, and that was his code word for we're going up to Groom Lake. Well, several weeks later, when uh, they took him up to Indian Springs and with a gun pointed in his head, they said, oh, that comment about going fishing? Boy, it sure took us a long time to figure that out. Yeah. They were pretty sarcastic over it. You know, they were taking, uh, taping both our phones here. Uh, anyway, uh, that was the night that they got the film of the saucer stitching its way across the, uh, the sky, the night sky that... Um, that uh, George Knapp and a few others used. Uh, incidentally, the first night we were so excited that the video camera stayed right on the bumper of the motorhome. It, it didn't get pointed. At it. I don't know why that happens, but it does. Anyway, the third night was uh, April 6, 1989, and that's when Gene and me and Bob, Bob's wife and his wife's sister, went up there. We wanted a car because I had blown the transmission on the motorhome, and Bob just had a two-place uh, Z, 280Z, and I had just a, my truck, so we ran, rented a car to go up there. There was no mystery about that, which people make a big deal about, but we just had no other way to get up there. We drove in. We had in the back Geiger counters, film, cameras, videos, everything. And as we drove down Groom Lake Road at that time, we thought that the legal cutoff was that road that comes down from Mailbox Road. And so when we got there, I said, look, let's just stay here. And, you know, even if we get a mile closer, it's not going to make that much difference in the film. And they said, no, no, let's go on. So we went another couple hundred feet, and we had the lights out. And I was leaning out the window, uh, telling them to go left and right. Uh, we stopped. And a 
couple sets of headlights here on We, as we stopped, a couple sets of headlights came on in front of the vehicle, and we decided to run because I thought we were in illegal territory. As it turns out, we weren't, and we could have all avoided a lot of trouble. And Bob never would have lost his job, and I never would have lost mine if we'd have just, you know, sat there and let him walk up to us. But the fact is, uh, we thought we were in illegal territory, and we turned around and we started going 90 miles an hour down the road with them in hot pursuit. Uh, we almost made it to the highway, but they had sent another Bronco around and cut us off. And when we saw him coming down the road, we stopped. Bob ran out in the desert. I jumped out and started setting up the telescope, and that's when the first Bronco came to a halt. And I ran up and threw my hands against the, the uh, top of the car, and I said, you know, holy smokes, you guys aren't dopers, are you? You scared the hell out of us out here. And they get out, and they all uh, were armed with machine guns. They stand around. There was like uh, four or five of them, and they stood at port arms around us. And the one guy said, what are you guys doing up here? And we said, oh, we're just looking at the stars. He said, well, why did you run? And I said, like I said, we thought you were dopers. And he said, well, we're not. We need to see some identification. And <clears throat> we showed him some, uh, we had to uh, give him our social security and, and the driver's license, and he ran it. And all this process took about 30 minutes. And he said, we can't kick you off the range here because it's BLM land. He said, uh, but we'll make it awful uncomfortable if you stay here. So they turned around and left. We stood behind the car waiting for about 15 minutes, and then Bob comes out of the desert. And we start talking about all the stuff that we'd done, the, you know, the, the uh, three weeks before, the two weeks before, all the stuff that we had done that night, all the preparation and everything, not realizing that all the time they had just gone about maybe 100 meters down the road, and we're filming us in infrared and uh, listening to us with a, a parabolic microphone, uh, all of which was readily made readily apparent to Bob the next day when he was taken up to security. But anyway, we had no idea what was going on, even though there were several real good clues. And one was, one of the guys down there dropped a, a scope. And we not only heard it, but we saw it. We saw a cigarette, but nobody ever decided, you know, I don't even know why we didn't go down and investigate, but the fact is we didn't. So anyway, we packed up our stuff and went out on the road, and as we got to the highway, we were stopped by the uh, Lincoln County Sheriff, Doug Lamoureux, who has since become a good friend. Um, and he kept us there for an hour. Uh, he wanted to see in the trunk, but we wouldn't let him in there, uh, mainly because that was where the gun was that Bob had taken out in the desert. But anyway, it seems that Lamoureux needed no, uh, knew exactly what was going on. He wanted to know why there was five people in the vehicle now and only four on the test site and he wanted to know where the gun was. So obviously there was communication between the security forces on the uh, test site and, and the sheriff. Anyway, we stood there for an hour. Nobody said anything. And um, finally, uh, to bring this all to um, uh, a halt, Bob decided to confess that it was his gun and it was in the trunk. And I saw him walking to go ahead and do it. And at that split second, Doug said, okay, look, here's what we're going to do. I've been advised to release you guys, but we don't want to ever see you here again, ever. And he let us go. And it was a real quiet ride home that night. And uh, the next day, Bob's boss, Dennis Mariana, uh, called him up and said, uh, Bob, I'm going to pick you up. Uh, don't go to the airplane. I mean, don't go to the EGG. He picked him up. He drove him up to Indian Springs, which is this site of the... Uh, uh, entire security for the test site and they actually pulled him out of the car with a gun in his head and a uh, gun in his ear and um, said Bob when we gave you the security clearance and told you this was a secret it didn't mean you could tell all your friends about the flying saucers now do you want to work with us or not and uh, he was non-committal and for the next few days, uh, he was making up his mind. And I think the reason he decided not to continue working up there was the fact that the last two trips that he made up to Groom Lake, he can remember flying up and flying back, but he couldn't remember what they did. And the mind control program that they have for the people that are involved up there in very, very classified programs um, is disconcerting. Uh, you can remember everything you have to when you're up there and work and everything, but when you come back, you can't remember anything. All you can remember is getting in the airplane and coming back. And that was real disconcerting to Bob, who has an IQ of uh, way over 200. Uh, and uh, he wants to know what's going on all the time. So.
Well, now, uh, we've got a picture of us together up here at Area 51, in fact, on Freedom Ridge, overlooking the facility. And, you know, we, we go up to Area 51, and uh, people say, well, you guys, are, you're, you're up there, and you're not seeing anything. Uh, Brad, uh, uh, Dahl Bradfield uh, said, uh, well, there's nothing happening out here, and we, our boys are out there 365 days a year. We're out there looking. It, we never see anything. Which is a lie. And then I was uh, about 50 feet away from the sheriff's vehicle in the parking lot of the little alien. This is Rachel, Cali Rachel Nevada. And uh, I've got a 200 millimeter lens. I'm not, an I'm not a professional. I'm a strictly an amateur photographer. And uh, I see something coming off the, the base. It stops in midair. I said, well, I, I've got this thing set on infinity. Let me shoot a picture. And here we have a picture of some sort of craft. It has the configuration of um, some sort of saucer. They do, they're at a loss for this, which is nonsense because these are the same people who say that the secret base at Groom Lake doesn't exist, and yet it's been on the front page of, uh, of popular science. It's been in Spin Magazine. It's been in Moo Magazine. It's been on uh, CNN. It's been all over the world. How do they have the guts to look us in the face and say this is absolute nonsense that we're talking about when they've lied to us about the U-2, the F-117, uh, the SR-71 Blackbird, the Stealth, the Aurora, everything. Every time they have lied and they're telling us, no, none of this exists, it doesn't happen, you guys are all fantasizing. What absolute rubbish, but yet... Some of the dummies out there really don't understand what the hell's going on. Well, what does it take to, to wake and shake the people up? Uh, what will they do? What, what won't they do to put us to rest? I mean, to, to put all opposition, all resistance to rest. Well, the final weapon, the final weapon is the weapon of fear, creation of fear and panic. And this will be done, this will be orchestrated from top secret uh, locations such as Area 51, Groom Lake, Dreamland. Uh, and Dreamland is an acronym for Data Repository and Establishment Management Land. Data Repository and Establishment Management Land. It's this Dreamland and it's in Area 51 where they're going to completely unite all the world's computer data networks and through, through uh, uh, this thing called the beast, which uh, is basically an orbiting uh, super uh, object that can possibly eject holographic images in the air and at the same time simulate some type of uh, well, uh, they, alien situation. They could simulate uh, a second coming. Could they not? I mean, with an antichrist, and people would be following this illusion in the air. Uh, one interesting thing, Anthony, is that uh, they, while they're simulating this scenario, who knows that maybe the uh, actual event may actually take place without the uh, uh, cooperation of the secret government. This is a very strange situation, but, you know, uh, every person in the world right now seem to be expecting some kind of a, a, a messiah. For example, Lord Maitreya. Well, Lord millions. Betreya. I mean, that's uh, Benjamin Krim's uh, right. baby over there. Uh, the Islamics, fact, uh, this is Rosemary's baby we're talking about, yes. right? Uh, Islamics are expecting yeah. their imam, the great leader, to appear shortly. Uh, the millions of Jews, especially Orthodox Jews, are expecting their messiah. And Christians, millions of them, are expecting their, uh, the, the uh, Christ. Now, for example, if the government knows that something is about to happen, they will create an alternative scenario to fit the belief system of the people. Uh, for example, they could stage the, uh, uh, this uh, uh, alien landing contact situation in order to explain away, for example, uh, the uh, rapture situation, well, if well, it well, occurs. This is what Mafia Mike or Michael Vaughn saw with the two ladies. They were my listeners. They went up there. They, the girl drug Mike out of his, his chair and brought him up there. said, I don't want to go alone. The girls, we're not going to go up there alone. We need a man along. They were confronted by the <laughs> Wacken Head SS, and that's when this event took place. Yes, dress rehearsal. For an rehearsal. hour and five minutes, a dress rehearsal, a mock invasion from space. Is it happening? Do you think this is all nonsense? 
You think, well, you better check it out. You had better check it out. These people control atomic energy. Tell us what occurred. Well, <clears throat> uh, my two friends showed up from Los Angeles. We uh, met in Las Vegas at my home. And we drove from Las Vegas out to uh, the area that's referred to as Area 51. We had stopped in a restaurant, a uh, small place called the Little Aoi Inn, where there's a great amount of discussion and memorabilia of what's going on out in that area. <clears throat> oh, we had uh, an early dinner out there. Uh, we talked to the owners. This is in Rachel, Nevada, which is Ra actually uh, towards the, well, it's north of the Groom Lake area in the, of the, in the Tickaboo Valley. Yes. Uh, we had an early dinner out there. We spoke with the owners of uh, the restaurant and uh, just had a very, very pleasant dinner. And uh, after dinner, uh, we spoke with a few more uh, residents of the area. And then we drove out to what's more commonly referred to as the Groom Lake area, mm -hmm. I believe. It's what it's referred to. We, uh, <clears throat> we wanted to get as close to the military installation as possible without going onto government land. Uh, the land that we were on was uh, public land. BLM. BLM, right, the Bureau of Land Management. And we got as close to uh, Area 51 as we could legally. And so we parked at the, at the base of uh, uh, a low mountain range there. And um, we parked our car, we got out, we got our lawn, cha our lawn chairs out, we were prepared for, to spend the night out there, which we did. And my two companions and myself uh, made ourselves comfortable. Now you had told the one girl that was uh, with you from Anchorage that you expected uh, the security forces to come out and uh, pay you a visit. You told her this <clears throat> in advance uh, of uh, that particular event. Could you tell us a little bit about what happened there? Well, actually, um, it was my friend from Alaska asked me. She said, do you think the uh, security personnel that's been known to frequent this area will come out and uh, visit us? We're talking about the Wackenhut SS. Yes, we are security personnel, so to speak, from Wackenhut International. Uh, and my answer to that was, uh, in my opinion, they'll probably be here within 10 minutes. <laughs> it was interesting that within the next 10 or 12 minutes, uh, two Wackenhut International uh, vehicles approached where we were parked and camped out. You have to picture this, Anthony. It is at night. It's dark. We're in the middle of a desert valley alone. And out of nowhere come uh, two vehicles. Uh, the men that approached us uh, were wearing Desert Storm military issue fatigues. Uh, they were both armed with weapons. I had noticed on the gentleman that was doing the... Uh, the speaking to us, the gentleman in charge, uh, he had uh, a microphone attached to his belt, and so I, I felt as though we were being tape recorded, our conversations were being tape recorded. Now the fellow in charge, it was really interesting, uh, he said, good evening, how are you folks tonight? And we said, we're just fine. Now at this time, the, the two women that I was with were getting a little nervous, and I could tell that they were nervous. And I could tell that they were intimidated, as I was. Uh, they asked us why we were there, and uh, we just explained that we wanted to spend the evening in the desert, and we were doing a little stargazing. And uh, I remember very clearly what the uh, gentleman in charge said. He said, so you just decided to come out to this area and stargaze tonight. And I answered in the affirmative. I said, Yes, we just thought we'd come out here and uh, just stargaze. It was obvious to me at that point that uh, 
this gentleman knew exactly what we were doing there. He knew that we were looking for UFOs or any sightings. And he knew that we knew, and we knew what he was doing there, along with his associates. Um, it was unspoken, but it was well understood in my mind. And the gentleman in charge said, well, uh, we're going to be leaving now. And uh, have a nice evening. But the phrase that he used, his last statement to me, uh, really gave me cause to pause. And, and ponder the statement that this man in charge had to say. He said, consider this a friendly warning. At that moment, I felt very intimidated again and very nervous about being in this area. I had made uh, the decision to stay the night with my two friends and see if we could observe something in that area. But in, in the words of the Wacken Hut, officer in charge consider this a friendly warning and at that time i began to feel quite intimidated it was at that time that uh, these two gentlemen left got in their blazers and drove away each one in an opposite direction one towards area 51 and the other back towards the main highway highway 375 yes Here's Lou Epton. From Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. Hello, everyone. This is Lou Epton. And in the first hour of today's program, two outstanding investigative reporters who, between them, have almost 40 years digging into the behind-the-scenes activities of the government. And they both, just this morning, come back from Rachel, Nevada. Rachel, Nevada. How many of you are familiar with Rachel, Nevada? You may know it better as the home of Area 51. But right now, let's all say good morning and good to have you in studio, Anthony Hilder and Nario Hayakawa. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Lou. We've got to remind the people that this is the place where the government first tested the B-2, the F-117, the SR-71 Blackbird, uh, the, all of these stealth craft, and are now testing the Aurora. And in each and every case, the government has lied. This is a black project. It is above top secret. There is some 20,000 people that live underground in that facility. It's a network of tunnels. We're talking about tunnels that may be 70 feet across with uh, two trains going down and enough extra room for a, for a roadway underneath the ground, underneath the Tigu Valley. But that's another story with, with Mafia Mike. And you've been down in some of the tunnels I've been in tunnels here at uh, Area 51. Uh, yeah, Area 51, yes. And you described them yesterday as being about 70 feet across. Approximately, yeah. 70 feet across. I didn't actually measure them, but that's, you know, two locomotives and a place to drive a big semi. These are different tunnels than the tunnels that they used for the nuclear... Those are different tunnels. I know what I know the tunnels. There was a gentleman here. I know the tunnel that he worked in. It's, uh, it's quite a large tunnel. It's... Uh, it goes into the mountain, uh, uh, not just a few miles, but further than a few miles. And, uh, and the purpose of those particular tunnels is for testing nuclear devices. You know, it's not uh, no different than the, uh, the holes that they go on the ground for exploding bombs. But the, the devices in the tunnels that they explode are more or less smaller, you know, controllable devices, devices that they... Uh, are not going to be a, a worry that you know they're going to take the top of the mountain off. The other tunnels that are in for different things. You can't talk about those. Well, I'm not going to talk about those. Can you say where they're at? Talk to them. Uh, yeah, uh, you can get in. Uh, well, I, it's approximately that's. <laughs> in the tunnels uh, that are going from the Groom Lake facility, it goes out across. And underneath the Tikaboo Valley, as I understand it, they're 70 feet across? I don't know too much about the tunnels, but we did find a new base out there. It was kind of interesting. Uh, I heard about it in 1983-84. A friend of mine was in construction. And he was up there working on TTR, Tonopah Test Range. And I was pumping him, and I said, hey, anything else going on up there? He says, yeah, as a matter of fact, there is. He said, uh, 
over on another range they're building something then i talked to a guy who, to, who uh, drove a fuel truck up there and he said yeah he said uh, he said once i was uh, delivering fuel up to ttr and he said where we come in at gold reed he said i had to wait for something like an hour for a, a procession of cement trucks going by he said it was just unbelievable was how many cement trucks there were and uh, the facility is called sandia and i'll show you where it is it's in uh, paiute mesa and they started in 1980 and they finished in 1987. Um, i did a little story down here on channel three about it and a guy called in after the newscast and said yes i uh, i'm from uh originally from el paso and i was hired to work on sandia and he said yes we started in 1980 finished 1987 it's totally underground there's you can't see anything above ground and believe me i've tried even though the closest point you can get to it on the you're going to show me the picture or where which runs the location of it yeah um the closest you can get to it is 25 miles and uh, it's a long ways. The, the guys that fly into it say that uh, when you la land there, and I'm talking about EG and G special projects, uh, they take the passengers in and out. They say, they say you can't see the runway until the last second. And then they land. They're not allowed to ever get out of the airplane like up at Groom Lake. They can go to the cafeteria. At this place, they have to sit in the cockpit. They're not allowed to get out. Uh, when the passengers get out, he said they just go behind a little knoll and disappear. I'm sure the stairways mm -hmm. or whatever, but. Uh, there's nothing. You can't see anything up there. It's it's really, it's very well hidden. And during the Gulf War, a friend of mine talked about it. I think this technology of hiding runways came about in 1980 because I heard about it then, but I didn't have any examples during the Gulf War. During the Gulf War, I worked for a cargo company that took, um, that uh, did a lot of uh, uh, flying into the Gulf. And although this didn't happen to me, it happened to a friend of mine where he got down to uh, Cairo and uh, got just south of Cairo about 100 miles and got uh, vectored by the American Airwax for delivery of what was in the airplane. And it was at night and uh, they couldn't see anything and he was told when to put his flaps down, when to put his gear down and at 500 feet lights came on and he landed there and they unloaded, uh, took off and went on his way. Since we navigate by inertial guidance, he knew exactly where he was and he had occasion like a week later to come over to the same spot and there was it was just the middle of the desert there wasn't a trace of anything nothing so they have really good capability of hiding runways now people think groom lake is you know this is one of a kind uh facility and it is a very big secret facility but like in 1980 there was 30 other what they call a axos uh, aircraft uh, access only you can't drive in it you know 1980 there was 30 so today there may be more there may be more there may be less but this Las Vegas this highway uh, 95 this is 93 this is Mercury this is Beatty these are the places where I was trying to hike up to they were the closest to the border that you could leave with in the Sandia here's Sandia when they built it they put this extra little Secure, uh, uh, security range around here. There's absolutely no indication that anything is there except an enormous power line going right into there and it just stops now. Coming from where? Coming from down, down here, maybe down as far as here. This whole area is uh, uh, NRDA where they uh, originally built the, uh, the nuclear rocket. All that facility is there. This is the famed Yucca Mountain where they want to store stuff. This is Groom Lake. That's the new strip there. TTR is up there. The orientation of the runway is there. On December 23rd, I was flying a mail contract uh, in a DCA. And uh, I came by this way, just to the north of here, going into Oakland. And... Um, uh, I tuned in Dreamland 120.35. As a matter of fact, if you want to listen to them going in and out, I can put it on the scanner because I got a big antenna that goes here. So it was about 5:30 in the afternoon, real cloudy, real dark, and everything. So I just turned on 120.35 and said, uh, "Dreamland, Dreamland, John Lear and Bob Lazar wish you a Merry Christmas." And do you know that nobody answered me. <laughs> it happened about approximately 30 minutes after the Wackenhut units had left.
And we experienced this, my two companions and myself, all at the same time. And the best way I can describe it is this way. It was a, a rumbling, low, guttural sound. Like that of an earthquake? Almost. Or like a subway train in New York? Similar, similar, but not quite. This happened in a period of a few seconds, what happened. But we all experienced this at the same time. It felt to me as something was moving not only underneath the ground that we were standing on, but underneath the entire valley. That was my perception and feeling of what was happening. It was a rumbling, low sound that was passing through under the valley, underneath the actual ground we were standing on, across the whole valley, going from point A to point B, across the entire valley. It was the strangest sensation I had ever experienced in my life. I have been in earthquakes. It was similar, but not quite the same. It felt as though the ground that we were standing on was hollow underneath the ground. It almost felt like there was some kind of hollowness under the ground and something very large, very large, was passing underneath us, not just underneath us, but across the entire valley. And it happened within a period of several seconds, this phenomena. While this was happening, one of my companions that was looking, I believe, north, uttered the words, my God. And as this sound was going across the valley, my other companion and I looked in the direction that she was looking. And we saw the most incredible phenomena that I've ever seen in my life. Looking up in that portion of the sky that she was looking at, I observed 16, 18, possibly 24, what I would consider intelligently controlled and directed craft, if you will, taking the sky. Uh, it was similar to watching the Super Bowl when both teams take the field. I had never seen any phenomena like this in my life, and they were as we turned, as we saw, as we heard this sound going across the valley, my companions and I just looked up in the sky and these objects had just taken formation in the Could sky. Can you describe the objects, the color? <clears throat> well, they change colors. But uh, my first impression of these objects were silver, very shining points of light. The young lady was with you as an artist, and you've got a... You know, photograph here, yes. Well, not a photograph, a, a drawing. A drawing. Um, there were so many... Let's, uh, let's, see, right. let's see this. There were so many of these... This is the mountains here, and these are the dozens of, uh, of uh, small craft... What are the, uh, these balls of light coming down? Well, first, and this phenomena went on for about 15 to 20 minutes, I would guess, these smaller points of light that were turning from silver at times to a, a, a reddish hue to a green colors to amber colors and aqua colors. They do change color. Um, these smaller points of light here are craft. And again, I say there were 16, 18, possibly 24. There were so many of these that we, we just couldn't count them. Now, it appeared that they were maneuvering. They were on some type of maneuvers. Uh, they would go from one part of the sky we were watching completely across the valley to the other side of the valley in literally a second or two seconds. 
they would form into groups of threes or fours. Well, this would be impossible with any conventional aircraft. And if they would fly that distance, would they stop on a dime? They would stop. <laughs> the incredible uh, distances that these craft, if you will, were traveling in the matter of seconds. I'm not familiar with any type of technology. Well, these are flying objects. These are definitely intelligently controlled. Unidentified flying, flying objects. Flying objects, yes, exactly. Or UFOs. UFOs. I was experiencing a visual sighting of possibly two dozen UFOs traveling across the night sky. Well, the you're talking really about the Grand Slam, the, the great jackpot of UFO sightings. Well, as I said earlier in this interview, I've always had an interest in, in this type of phenomena. I have seen films, I've seen documentaries on TV, I've seen motion pictures of different sightings or whatever, but I have never seen a photograph or a video or even a motion picture presentation. How about Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Steven Spielberg? Yes, I've seen that movie. Would you say that this would be similar to that sighting? In my opinion, this was a lot more spectacular than Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Close Encounters of the Third Kind was a movie. What I experienced out there was total reality. And I understood immediately that I was witnessing something that I had never before seen on film or heard of happening. It was a major sighting in my opinion at that time and since that time I have spoken with other researchers and people of interest that say what we experienced out there and I thank God that I had uh, two witnesses with me to corroborate this story I realize how hard this is for some people to believe uh, hearing something like this in the past I would have had trouble believing it too but I witnessed this uh, I experienced this with two other live human beings. And what we saw for the next 20 minutes was obviously some type of craft on maneuvers. I mean, that's the impression I got. You, you talked uh, privately about uh, lights coming from a craft, smaller lights, like and, a mothership or something of that nature. Well, the, the initial phenomena of these two dozen craft, if you will, were on maneuvers for about 20 minutes in my estimation. And then, <laughs> it really got wild. Um, the best way I can describe it, and if we can have that uh, yes. rendition again, um, this is my friend, um, her, her painting of this, her description of this, it started with one sphere. It was, it appeared to be a supernova while all these other craft were maneuvering across the sky. One supernova would start from nowhere. It would just, it would just, it just started. And I've never seen anything like this in my life. The, the actual size, the size of this, was the first thing that, that shocked me. How big was it, say, in comparison to the moon? To a full moon, I would guesstimate that it was one-sixth to one-eighth the size of a completely full moon. Now, you have to understand, Anthony, that we were observing this from about 10 miles away. And to see something that large, for me, to see something <clears throat> that large in the sky just appear out of nowhere, something a sixth the size of a full moon in the middle of nowhere. And then these other round spherical spheres or disks start coming out of it. I mean, to, to me, this was just an incredible sight. First, this supernova, completely round, and then out of it came... And this went on for the next 40 minutes. So the, the, the discs that were coming out of it, were they as large as the Nova? A little bit smaller, in my opinion, but they would... 
<laughs> it was happening so fast, they would come out of the first sphere, sometimes only three, sometimes four, sometimes five, sometimes as in this drawing here, seven. And this not only happened once, but what it, it would happen approximately every four or five minutes, and it would go from one part of the sky to the other part of the sky, and it kept repeating itself. The first time we observed this, um, it was uh, incredible, to say the least. And to my recollection, the first time it happened, only three spheres or disks or saucers came out of possibly the mother ship. Uh, it happened approximately five or six minutes later on the opposite side of the valley when this phenomena took place again. To my recollection, four or five disks came out of the Nova. And, and it, it kept repeating itself every five or six minutes, four or five minutes, around the entire sky. It was the most incredible aerial phenomena that I've ever seen. Uh, at this time, uh, my two companions and myself were completely stunned. I mean, we, you know, we were giggling. We couldn't, we just couldn't believe what we were witnessing. Uh, as I said, uh, we all have an interest in this, but I had never even seen a film, uh, a Hollywood animated movie, uh, to compare with what I was witnessing. I was witnessing a major in my opinion, a major UFO sighting. Uh, and God knows what else was going on up there, but this went on for over an hour. Jordan Maxwell, you know, these fellows who've done a lot of research with me and we've done the Millennium 2000 tapes. Mm -hmm. uh, he went up there after the Mesquite, the UFO meeting, and uh, he is a skeptic. If, if he can't see it or touch it or feel it, it doesn't uh, exist. It doesn't exist. Yeah. And, uh, uh, he went up to see Joe and Pat, and they were very nice, and they said, well, uh, if you want to see something, Jordan, you're going to go down to the highway here and then turn to the right about 20 miles and uh, go over to the mailbox road, and this is where you generally park, and you can see uh, craft sometimes. So uh, knowing wrong way, Jordan, he goes over and he turns left. He goes north about 20 miles. He's hunting for some damn road. There's no mailbox. He Knowing goes off. Jordan, I'm not surprised. And uh, Jordan goes out about two miles, and they stop. And uh, he was with Ivy West and the fellow named Paul, who's his sidekick. And uh, they were out there for about a half hour, and they, it was sort of overcast. And the car, clouds sort of parked away, and they looked directly overhead. We stopped the car. We got out. And the first thing we did, we were looking around, and it was so very, very dark, you couldn't believe how dark it is out there, and it's overcast anyway. Seeing nothing, and then we looked up, and when we looked up, we had quite a sight. Right over the top of our heads, I would judge, we're right at the, at the cloud line, just a hair above the clouds, whatever that might be, maybe 1,500 feet, I don't know. But just above the clouds, from north going south very slow not flying as such but rather floating in a very mysterious floating way uh, at least seven at least seven white round glowing objects uh, a few things immediately hit me and I was very impressed and rather shaken at the moment uh, because I've heard all the stories, and I've seen lights in the sky just as everyone else has, and I'm from uh, an area in the south that has had many sightings, so I, I'm aware of, of all the lights in the sky stories, but not like this. This was like seven round glowing objects all moving together very slowly, floating passed us right over our heads and what struck me is the fact that they are, there was no sound whatsoever and no metallic superstructure as such just white round plate round not like a ball white round floating objects moving almost mysteriously floating past us from north going south 
I was stunned, and so was Paul and Ivy. We, we, we stood there and were absolutely, for the few minutes, maybe two minutes, that we stood there just watching right over our heads, watching these things move, we were very visibly shaken by the sighting. It was a tremendous and very mysterious, beautiful, rather scary. And at that point, about two minutes into the sighting, I got spoofed and I said, listen, we, I told Paul, I said, we better get out of here because I just felt that we're in the wrong place at the right time. I'm not in any way um, <clears throat> saying what, I, what it was, because I don't know what it was exactly that we were seeing. But I am, I'm convinced in my own mind that if this technology is so-called ours, then we must be quite a long way technologically than what we've been told. We're probably far, far more technologically advanced than what we as a people in this country know, if it was in fact our people. Uh, my sense of it is, and this is just my opinion, but based on what I actually saw and what I witnessed with my own eyes, I am totally convinced in my mind that this was not of this world. Because uh, I, like most people, have seen just about all kinds of aircraft I've never seen anything do what these crafts were able to do. It was a very impressive display. And uh, above that, I would not want to uh, try and decide what it was we were seeing. But what we did see was absolutely uh, a beautiful experience. It was a very powerful experience. Uh, as of this moment, I am totally convinced that uh, there's something going on, <clears throat> not just up at Area 51, though, they, though you can bet on that, but I believe that we are being visited. And there's no doubt in my mind about that. When we had first gotten out of the car um, and we had looked straight up, uh, the clouds were just moving out of the way. And we saw, well, we saw two immediately. And then as the clouds moved, it revealed the others. and. Um, Again, floating, the, just the, the total silence was what uh, impressed me so much because you're out there in the middle of nowhere and it's, you know, you can't hear, you could hear a pin drop. Mm -hmm. It was so quiet. And so if these things were making any noise at all, we would have heard it. And there was just an aspect of it that was just really beautiful, the way these things were floating and everything. And... Uh, um, you know, I, uh, when Jordan got a little bit spooked and wanted to leave, um, you know, I definitely wanted to stay. I convinced him to stay a little bit longer. But then we, when we rode down the road, Ivy and I, Ivy was in the front seat, mm -hmm. I was in the back seat. We rolled down our windows and stuck our heads up to, to continue watching these things. And so that's how we were until we got all the way back to the highway. And um, then... After we were like a, a mile or two down the highway, the cloud cover came back and we lost them. But during that entire time, we were witnessing these things doing things in the sky. So wait, wait a second. Were they going in formation or were they there was a, zipping around? Um, both. There was, there was a, as we were driving down, they were, uh, some of them would, you know, zip and then just stop and everything. But when we stopped for the, for the first time, actually the second time from the first area, um, we got out and these things were floating in like a, a formation and we saw them as they're, as they're floating, as they're moving, they're, they're doing these maneuvers. And so they, like one for instance, they went right in together and almost touching each other and then they would just immediately, you know, instantly uh, pop out and form a perfect circle. It was just awesome. And I was telling Jordan, because this was, you know, our second stop, on, and there was another one down the road, I was saying, you know, these guys are putting on a show for us. Let's stay and watch <laughs> it. Yeah. You know? And then there was like a, a kind of a star formation that they did. Um, and, uh, God, it was... But wait a second, they, they were on basically the same base course. But exactly. That, but moving around within that. Yes, yes. And we watched that for like about two minutes, and, and I said, that's enough, I'm getting out of here. 
then he actually at this moment I wish now uh, we had stayed but I got spooked and I wanted to get out of there because I could just picture the military coming for us uh, I believe the average person on planet earth that would experience and see what I saw in Area 51 that particular evening in June of 1992 given the limited information that's available to the general public I believe if the average citizen saw that it would scare the living hell out of the average person throw them into a complete state of panic uh, it's my understanding that this type of aerial phenomena whether it be extraterrestrial or terrestrial whether or not the extraterrestrials are teaching our American Air Force pilots to fly these craft I believe it's part myself I believe it's part of some a grand scheme to frighten people into you, accepting something to frighten people to accept a new world order I could see the possibilities of that very easily Our experiments being conducted 
on human beings at a sublevel of an area called S4, which is about 13 miles south of the infamous Dreamland, Area 51. Well, as a professional microbiologist and bioastronomer with over 35 years experience, I have to say without any reservation that the answer to this question is yes. That there are experiments being conducted and have been conducted for the last 20 to 30 years. Have these individuals, this oligarchy of evil, this evilarchy, actually created beings, uh, some sort of, uh, have they gone through some sort of gene splicing or have they developed some sort of creature or uh, they're going to come up with real aliens from outer space? Well, Anthony, uh, we have to look at the state of art in biotechnology in the United States. Uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, the nation's largest and the, the, the most uh, secret uh, conglomeration of research facilities on biogenetics, human genome project, uh, you name it. Oh, wait, it's wait, all you say human genome project. What is a human genome Basically, project? Basically, it's the manipulation of the genes uh, in the, uh, the uh, human uh, cells and so on, possibly to create possibly a robotoid type of... Uh, a uh, creature for to replace certain types of works uh, for example uh, there are many uh, stories and uh, uh, second-hand information coming from people at security companies that uh, in sensitive remote uh, areas whereby they could be using artificial or man-made robotoid creatures to be yeah. like a guard at approximately three years ago, I had a personal confrontation with two, in, two individuals who I can only refer to as non-entities, soulless beings. While working on a non-related research project in the area of 50, in the area, the general area of Area 51, I accidentally stumbled on uh, these two individuals at approximately two o'clock in the morning. The first thing I noticed that was out of the ordinary was when this security vehicle pulled up, the guys couldn't drive. They kept driving off the road, crashing into this sagebrush, smashing into the Joshua trees. It was like a couple of young kids trying to learn how to drive. I walked up to the vehicle and tried to strike up a conversation with these two individuals. And the second thing that really amazed me was, one is I stuck my head inside the vehicle to talk to, these, to the driver. I noticed that for security personnel, they were unarmed. What is a humanoid like? Well, they were both in their mid-50s or late 50s, graying hair, uh, real identical, almost like twins. They had synthetic, almost synthesized voices, really robotic. And in almost a two-hour encounter of talking to these individuals, not once, not once did either one of these individual-like persons look at me. It was really difficult to talk to a profile. Uh, I tried to ask them various questions to probe information uh, as to what they were doing. Uh, and everything was a delayed response, an extreme long delayed response uh, in a very robotic type of uh, monotone. How about the possibility of Frankenstein factories where they create alien looking there's no beings. question about it i had a friend that worked up at the test site who uh went to work in the 80s the the early 80s late 70s and early 80s over in saudi arabia for uh, one of the major contractors over there Salman bin laden and he had um, a lot of strange things happen he came back you know and, and before i got into this in in uh, seven years ago I was relatively straight. I mean, I, you know, did my stint for the CIA. I believed in, uh, you know, God and Apple Pie and Chevrolet and, uh, you know, flying saucers to me were, I mean, just, you know, couldn't even uh, mention it. You know, I wasn't interested then. So he, we sat down in the early 80s uh, at the, uh, my house over on the other side of town and we're kind of saying, you know, what's going on? And I know nothing. And there was kind of a lull in the conversation. He says, um, John, what do you know about, um, I can't think of the word, 
We were talking about genetic engineering. What is it when they create a, a human? Cloning? Create a big old, yeah, he said, cloning. He says, uh, John, what do you know about cloning? And I said, you know, nothing. I mean, this was so far out to me. And he said, just let me tell you, it's all real and it's all happening. And this is from Cecil McMaines, a guy who's so down to earth, who worked on the SR-71, who did a lot of stuff, you know. And he would never, ever come out with something so unusual as so, that. So they have Frankenstein factory. Sure. It wasn't until about three months later that I was given transcripts from another colleague who had heard about such rare encounters in this area. And in the transcripts, it is stated that a security officer who had resigned from the area resigned because he had found out that his partner was a genetically engineered Another really strange, strange thing happened during this encounter. Being in the restricted zone, I, obviously I, under normal circumstances, would have probably been arrested or uh, escorted out of the area, except for two hours, these two individuals, uh, who I call the non-entities, did nothing but try to feed me. They kept asking me if I wanted apples fruit, more coffee, water. Uh, it was the strangest thing I have probably ever encountered in 46 years. At no time did they ask me why I was there uh, or to leave the area. It was, do you need more food? Can we help you? Uh, so, to reiterate, are there individuals that look like us, but are soulless beings, non-entities? Perhaps you've heard about the abduction phenomena. Whether you believe it or not, there is something going on in a dark, covert world. Not in Area 51, but sub-levels, areas that are not yet being brought to the general public's knowledge. How about the, miss the missing kids, the milk carton kids? You know, I used to talk a lot about that, and um, there was a lot of kids that were missing in like 83, 84, 85, and it's my understanding that uh, the FBI discontinued um, annual reports of missing people. because well, There was just... a million that were, that were missing, and then actually about 80 or 90,000 that just simply disappeared. I mean, they didn't wind up as uh, prostitutes on Hollywood Boulevard or yeah. you know, as sex slaves or in some shallow grave. It's 80 or 90,000 that just simply disappeared. Yeah. Yeah. We have both seen the film that was taken out of the Dulce facility. Yeah. Why would somebody uh, make pictures like this showing the creation of some sort of alien being? And this is a, a facility. This is a facility that's... Uh, run by the United States government, I mean, with your tax monies. Yeah, I've, I've, I've heard uh, Hamilton talk about uh, the Dulce facility, and I've also heard about, you know, genetic engineering programs at Area 51. Yeah, there's no question that Dulce exists. Um, you know, I was the one that, that kind of led the research on that. Uh, I was at a meeting in Crestone, Colorado, and Tom Adams handed me a letter uh, from a lady who lives in Las Vegas, and she was the one that tipped us off that this thing exists existed so I talked to her and um, she knew the location of uh, some photos and videotape that had been taken inside Dulce uh, by a guard who escaped during what what they call the Dulce Wars of 1979 um, he used to contact her every six months and he said if I ever miss contacts two in a row for a year you can go after this box which they had hidden uh, somewhere here in Nevada that contained uh, six minutes of videotape, 25 black and white photos, and some other documentation about what went on in Dulce. Uh, about two years ago, he did turn up missing. He never, we never heard from him. And I think there was like 12 or 13 attempts after the box, but it had been hidden uh, maybe at least 10 years ago in the terrain and the, and the foliage and everything changed. I don't think they ever got it out. He said on level five, he'd walk on by and 
people would be in cages and screaming and begging for, for help and he was told to, I heard that. to walk straight on through and not look or pay attention yeah. these people are all mad I heard that and then um, from another source Air Force engineering source I heard that that when he went there they referred to it as section D um, and then uh, Bob heard it referred to when he was up at the test site uh, just once and somebody said uh, mentions something about being shipped to Tulsa, but that's the only reference you ever heard to it. Now I call these, uh, the guys who are working in the facility as Igor's, uh, the invisible government's obedient robotons. But there, it really is a Frankenstein factory. Good game. You were over, uh, at the Hellendale facility, yes. right? Yes. And the, at the Hellendale, you were taking a look at a, a, one of these objects on top of the pylon, and you, you observed a normal sized man and then a small that is exactly creature. true that and, and is exactly true we were watching from about a mile and a half away uh when we saw several trucks uh go near the pylon and as the metallic object was uh, came down on a ground level uh several men from the truck uh went out of the truck and uh, began touching or covering this object and uh, a partner of mine was looking at the binocular next to me and he was looking at uh, the, the uh, man from the truck and the object and then suddenly he screamed at me and he says look there is a child over there and this is a true incident uh, and uh, what he was looking at was he described one of the uh, persons to be very very short so he he he, uh, he said it, it must have been a child now, i was talking to a lady up in uh this is up in Nevada at, uh, in uh, Las Vegas. She was telling me about uh, the conversation she had with her boyfriend who was uh, uh, formerly in security over at Area 51. She said that they have a live alien, a live alien on the base and that they have uh, anti-gravitational flying discs, flying saucers, and that her uh, boyfriend had seen one of these, not only seen one, but had actually touched it. And of course, we have the same uh, story from Stan Barrington, who used to work with uh, Bill Cooper. In fact, Bill Cooper's book, uh, Behold a Pale Horse, is an excellent uh, document and gets into a lot of this uh, secret technology. Yes, again, what we're hearing about, well, let's say the alien entities, uh, these entities may be uh, uh, something that is staged for the benefit of the viewer uh, by the government or they could be robotoid uh, creatures that we created uh, from through biotechnology uh, or it could be uh, a materialization of some unknown entities from another dimension we don't know but the, the interesting thing is the how the public is being manipulated into believing in this alien presence. I'm hearing rumors at Area 51 that there are, well, there's at least one live alien living there. There definitely is one live alien, uh, regardless of what Bob says today. Yeah. We're talking about Bob Lazar. Um, during December and January, uh, December of 1988, January of 1989, when he was working out there, he sat right in that chair uh, whenever he'd come back from the test site and he'd tell me what he saw and I'll never forget the January 1989 I was sitting at that desk writing out checks and he comes in and he's a little fidgety and after the first night that he got back from the test site we never discussed anything in this room because they seemed to know everything that was going on so he came in sat down and he looked fidgety and he kind of went you know let's go so we went out in the back and there's a stable back there, a little alley back there. And I remember that I was, you know, thought he had something really neat to tell, so I didn't grab my coat. I was in a short sleeve. And we went out there, and I remember it was bitter cold, the wind was blowing. And we stood in the alley, and I said, what, what, what? And he said, John, you will never know what it's like to see your first alien. I said, God, neat, why'd you see it? And he described the circumstances of walking down this hallway, being led by two guards and having, coming up, uh, going down the hallway and looking through this window. As a matter of fact, I have the original drawing that he drew yeah. this scene. And he said it was a, maybe a 12 by 12 window and it had wires running through it. And he looked through it 
And there was two scientists facing him in white lab coats and the little gray talking to them. I said, could it have been a Tao? Could it have been a midget? He said, no, John, it was an alien. And uh, it was just really neat. He said he walked down once, and then when he came back, he looked in, and they weren't there. But, and today, you ask Bob about that, he says, well, that's what John says, you know, but I really don't remember myself. But I remember. I remember the night it happened, and I remember going out and him being pretty Do you have the picture? Up. Yeah, I'll show you a little drawing that he made of what it looked like looking uh, through the window. See this thing here? This is the piece of paper <coughs> that, Bob, that Bob drew that night. Yeah. First of all, he drawed how the hangars were, 360 feet, yeah. each 46 bays. Um, he, this was the corridor, this was the window, and those were the two scientists mm -hmm. and the little gray. The scientists are facing us, the gray is going that way. And that's what he saw through that window. And he's very meticulous, showing, you know, where and under what circumstances he saw it. Uh, this is the drawing of how the hangers fit up against the mountainside. So this, uh, this is the gray here? Right there. Yeah. Yeah, these are the two scientists, and that's the window he looked through. The, oh, I see. Yeah. The people were to accept uh, the existence of an alien being or an alien race of people. Might this not serve to destroy Christianity? Is this the program to destroy well, belief in God and uh, have the public accept a belief in government? No question about it. Exactly, Anthony. You hit it right on the nail. Uh, they need, or they need something to replace the, uh, let's say, the uh, Christian belief. Uh, it's my personal belief that uh, uh, a substitute uh, will be created. And this is why they well, have these, to... These people are satanic, yes. are they not? No question well, about no, it. The New World <laughs> Order is a satanic yeah. program to create a one-world fascist uh, government led by the Antichrist, which I believe is alive somewhere in Europe right now. This has been the program from thousands of years and the final stages of that program is just about to begin in a few short years and this is the culmination of the program to create a new world order a luciferian new world yes. order and they plan to bring it in probably i would say with uh, with the help of uh, the panic project i think so in fact we take a look at it's so many uh, of the of the programs that have gone on we take a look at uh, i go back to you know the the, the german saucer here uh, this is one of the Hanabu craft, and the, you can see the uh, Panther tank uh, turret there. <laughs> we know that these were developed under Adolf Hitler. We know that they came to the United States uh, during Operation Paperclip. We know that uh, uh, Walter Dornberger and uh, uh, Werner von Braun uh, worked together. We know that these projects were developed, but they all went underground. This is, these are the black projects that you're talking about. Yes, that's right. Uh, in 1947, uh, Central Intelligence Agency was created, uh, the successor to OSS, and uh, without the help of uh, German uh, SS officers and their intelligence gathering techniques, uh, it would have been impossible to create a CIA. And the CIA has uh, several branches that specializes in, uh, of course, the uh, creation of spy planes. But all of these ideas are, uh, uh, they stem from the uh, yeah. German uh, know-how, you see. Well, we have a, uh, really a neo-Nazi New World Order. In fact, Adolf Hitler's second book was called The New World Order. And I take a look at, you know, here's a film uh, put out, UFO Secrets of World War II. German flying saucer. It's a lousy looking cover, but a very, very good piece exposing this. I mean, it's not uh, fantasy, it's fact. But those people who are manipulating the media try to make those who are exposing the big lie out to either be enemies of the people or absolute fanatics. They come forth with publications, and this is an example, the Weekly World News. Now, they say that... Uh, uh, Twelve U.S. senators are space aliens. Of course, I could probably be believe that of Al Gore because he's so robotic. But uh, then they have a picture of uh, Bill Clinton supposedly shaking a hand of a space alien. Now, this is misinformation and disinformation. It's tabloid, yellow journalism. 
Uh, and they put forth this pap and crap to get people thinking, well, anybody who talks about this has to be some sort of loony. But we need to separate the fact from the fiction. We need to get down to the bottom line. And you need to get educated. And you need to pick up books like None Dare Call It Conspiracy. This is what it's all about. And, uh, Norio, I, uh, I see the expansion of this, uh, of this information coming out across the world as a direct result of your activity. Uh, in Japan, you brought uh, the Tokyo Broadcasting System over here. And a Nippon Television You bought, brought in Nippon Television. And there has been millions of people on the, on, uh, in Japan, in the islands of Japan, that have seen this story because of you. I mean, how many, is this 40, 50, 60 million people? Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, Nippon Television was the first television company uh, worldwide to have had a two-hour special program on Area 51, even before Area 51 itself became a, uh, like, a, you know, a popular term right now in American television. Uh, but uh, uh, Nippon Television already broadcast in 1990. Now, in 1990, mm -hmm. I took a team of Nippon Television a crew and we went to uh, the perimeters of Area 51 and we saw the amazing flight of this uh, craft that was being tested and uh, it's my complete confidence, I can state confidently that they are being tested even right now uh, in Groom Lake. There's a small segment of the United States government that makes scientific and technological judgments from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. If the following information is true, the United States government also makes judgments on a historical, philosophical, and even theological level from a knowledge base that is not available to the general public. These are excerpts from some of that information. When I went to work, I was flown from McCarran Airport in Las Vegas to Area 51, which is a highly secure government base on the Nevada test site. Area 51 is located about 125 miles north of Las Vegas near the Groom Mountains and the Groom Dry Lake Bed. From Area 51, I was bused to an even more highly secure facility located about 15 miles south of Area 51 called S-4. S-4 is situated at the base of the Papoose Mountains by the Papoose Dry Lake Bed. The S-4 installation is built into the mountain and the nine hangar doors are angled at about 60 degrees. These doors are covered with a sand textured coating to blend in with the side of the mountain and the desert floor. The hangar was equipped with typical tools and extensive electronic equipment. It also had a machine with an X-ray emblem on it and an overhead crane rated at 20,000 pounds. As part of my indoctrination into the program at S4, I would randomly be taken into a small room which contained a table, a chair, and 120 or so briefings in blue folders. I'd be left there to read for varying amounts of time, usually about half an hour. These briefings contained a wide spectrum of information, mostly relating to aliens and alien technology. The gravity amplifiers of the disc can be focused independently, and they are pulsed and do not stay on continuously. To me, these reports were simply words on paper. So to keep from saying allegedly and supposedly in every sentence, I'll relay this information to you as I read it, since I've already put this disclaimer on it. This technology that you've learned about thus far was brought here by some alien beings from the Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 star system. These stars are located in the constellation of Reticulum, which can only be seen from the southern hemisphere. Zeta Reticuli is a binary star system, which means it has two stars, and is located approximately 30 light years from Earth. These beings are from Reticulum 4, which is the fourth planet out from Zeta Reticuli 2. The beings are three to four feet tall and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. They have grayish skin and large heads with almond-shaped wraparound eyes. They have very slight nose, mouth, and ear positions and are hairless. These beings said that man was the product of externally corrected evolution. They said that man, as a species, had been genetically altered 65 times. They referred to humans as containers, yet I don't know what we're containers of. We're talking about the development of a panic project. And our new video is called The Panic Project. In fact, yeah. you're in it. There's, there's two television cameras, uh, two television crews actually in the studio today, unbeknownst to our listeners, uh, putting together your interview with us, which is going to be out on film. Well, Anthony, you came out many years ago with uh, a number of recordings and videos, uh, among them Crisis Creation, which pretty well explained how by creating a panic situation, 
the government can justify stepping in and taking over. Well, that is, they create the problem, yeah. and then give you the solution, and the solution is always worse than the problem. Well, you know, in 1962, Kennedy um, ordered the, um, what became known as the, uh, the report on uh, Iron Mountain, and what he was interested in was finding out if there's anything other than war that could stimulate the economy to the extent war could. We've always had a war to stimulate the economy. Uh, always had one. In recent years, we had Vietnam and then Saddam Hussein, which was all manufactured. I mean, I flew an airline for an airline. We used to take the troops, American troops in there, Green Berets, to train Saddam for the two or three years before that war, you know. But they create the crisis. They create the crisis. So uh, the report from Iron Mountain said really that there was uh, nothing that would stimulate uh, the economy as well as war. And they had considered um, uh, medical research, space research. Uh, they said that there was one thing that, that would stimulate it, and that was um, a threat from an extraterrestrial species, real or imagined. Kawa, you've been up to Area 51. How can we get to the people of the world this message that we are confronted with a group who wants to surrender all national sovereignty? I would think that every nation would be terrified at the thought of world government. Well, Anthony, I think that uh, we have to bring this message out to the people we have to tell them what's going on at Groom Lake and the surrounding facilities, uh, the Area 51, or another word for that is Dreamland. That entire section of Nevada is, sh should come under close scrutiny uh, by the public because it's our tax dollars that are being uh, put into this well, type wait a of minute, wait a black saying, project you're, wait, wait, programs. You're saying the tax dollars, in part that that's true, but I mean... This is a black project, and these black projects are financed with drug money. Uh, in a way, it's true. Uh, the, besides the black uh, budget funds, uh, they have to have extra source of, uh, of uh, finance to finance this multi-billion dollar project. And uh, I would say that the only other recourse is to get uh, illegal uh, funding. And, but uh, one thing for certain, is that they are not going to close the Groom Lake area, Groom Lake facilities. Uh, you see this preparation. What preparation do you see for the next step where they're not just simply saying it's coming, but that it's here? Well, right now, uh, a Galileo spacecraft is heading towards Jupiter. And, Anthony, this is so prophetic and... Uh, uh, it's just, uh, it's unbelievable, but, but yet, this is the plan, is to uh, put the Galileo uh, spacecraft around the orbit of uh, uh, Jupiter and to cause some kind of a, a huge, you know, the... Uh, ignition. Uh, ignition, yes. And uh, uh, back in, uh, a few years ago when... Uh, uh, the Galileo was launched, uh, they, it was a fact that they were ha carrying uh, a plutonium 
Uh, oh, 49 and a quarter pounds of plutonium, which is yes. used for igniting the hydrogen bomb. And I go to a, a, a film, 2010, this is Odyssey 2, The Year We Make Contact. This is an MGM production. What do they have in mind? I spoke about the uh, sending up of this uh, Galileo mission several years ago and said that it is my belief and I believe this to be true, that these people in this evil archy plan to ignite the planet Jupiter and rename it Lucifer. And that would be the uh, big event that uh, when in the, in the film they talk about something wonderful uh, happening. And I, I, I watched this film and I didn't see any mention of the renaming of this planet Lucifer, but we have the Millennium Society, who's supposed to sit at the base of, 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 of the pyramid at Giza, and we're all, they would all be looking up for something wonderful to, be, to happen at the, uh, the turn of the century, the new millennium. Uh, you know, I'm taking a look at uh, what was left out in Arthur C. Clarke's book, 2010. If I go to the library and pick it up, last chapter, Lucifer rising, 50 times more brilliant than the full moon, Lucifer had transformed the skies of Earth virtually banishing night for months at a time. And he goes on, but at the very back of this thing, and they're talking about the ignition of, of the planet Lucifer, he said, this quite brilliant concept has been taken seriously by a number of astronomers, notably NASA's Institute of Space Studies, Dr. Robert Jastrow, and may provide one of the best motives for the projected Galileo mission. You want to take a look at Time magazine, and we're talking about Jupiter being involved with Galileo, and Galileo has uh, 49 and a quarter pounds of plutonium. Something is going on. We are being set up, we are being prepared for a new world order. Oh, and by the way, uh, this uh, commentary uh, was, uh, this is by uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, and he's writing from Colombo, Sri Lanka, July 1981 to March 1982, five years before the Galileo mission took off. And they're interested in this concept of igniting Jupiter. So we'd have a binary star system and the renaming of it Lucifer. Would this not be an event, uh, like a panic project to get the people believing in Lucifer rather than God? Again, all these things are pointing out uh, Anthony, that we are indeed living in the la very last of the last days, as was prophesied uh, in the Bible, and uh, it, it's coming out. It's, it's being realized every day. The technology and so on is pointing out the, the, uh, the, the way. The, the book of Daniel says that in the last days, knowledge shall expand uh, tremendously, and people will travel to and fro, and this is exactly what's happening. Our technology of three months ago is old. But